Aloha, my name is John Kinimaka. We are here um, maybe about 10 minute drive away from Lahaina town where we lost our community. Um, we're here at Honokawai Park. Also now we call it Pu'ohonua or Honokawai. Well, Pu'ohonua is a sacred place of refuge, city of refuge. Honokawai is the name of this park here. Um, the day after the fire, we realized that we didn't have power. We are already situated in a very isolated part of the island where there's one way in and or actually there's two ways, two ways in and two ways out. Um, one of them would be going through the tunnel that heads towards the south that will get you to the other side of the island, the central side of the island. And then we have the Kahakuloa side that way where it's like one lane. So usually when the road shuts down, everybody tries to go out Kahakuloa and um, they'll shut it down because they don't want too many people going that way because there's one lanes and you can't get through. So uh, we were in a situation where we didn't have cell service. We didn't have power and eventually the road access had been blocked. Our harbors in Lahaina were blocked. Mala Wharf and Lahaina Harbor um, were just totally like in rubble and there was no way to get access through there on the road. Uh, there was a time where we had to rely on our private airport up here in Kapalua and also a Kahana boat ramp where for several days people were hungry. They managed to get the tourists out of here really quickly within the first week. All the tourists were put in shuttles and they were evacuated out of this area. Not sure where they went, left the island, but our focus was mainly right here to make sure that we got the supplies that we needed. We um, were very short on manpower as far as volunteers in the beginning. Um, we started off right here at this table. There was only one tent, a uh, little blue pop-up tent, a canopy tent that we had here. And we had like five cases of water. We started off with that and it just continued to grow. But as it grew, as the, the need for supplies and uh, you know gas, food, water, cell phone service, we were able to provide everything with everybody with all their needs from baby diapers, baby formula, to medics, to women's feminine hygiene. We have, a, we have a, our own kitchen, we have the medic tent. We also have a healing tent. So a lot of this stuff came eventually and it, it's continuing to grow. We have our entertainment center. We've been having concerts here and we just want people to know that like, this is a place for healing. This is a sacred place. This is where we can come together as a community and work together and heal and share our stories and basically get the necessary supplies that we need to, to be happy. And we just want to say thank you to everybody around the world, our community around the world, all the different countries that have come here. Um, we still haven't seen anybody come up in a National Guard truck or anybody come up in a government agency vehicle since day one, nobody's come up here and, and dropped off our supplies. Um, this is all our community, what they have done, whether it be from the other side, central, other parts of Maui, or from the outer islands, Lanai and Molokai, they came by boat to Kahana Ramp, and then through our private airport on small planes up here in Kapalua, uh, Oahu, and eventually like supplies that were coming from, from America and so on and so forth, other countries. Um, private side, nothing from the government. Um, we made sure that this would be a safe place here. We we marked it off so that our convoy lines could come through here and made stalls here. We just tried to keep it as safe as possible because we lost too much life. And we just wanted to make sure that people were being fed and nobody was suffering anymore. And we're, we're continuing our operations. Um, we're not gonna stop until everybody's provided for. It's gonna be a long process. It's gonna be in phases. We're just doing everything that we can do to, to accommodate everybody in every way and every need. And uh, we've been getting a lot of support from the hotels, you know, as far as like giving us rooms and, and just private donations and people letting us use their showers in the condos nearby. And um, yeah, so it, it's been a blessing. It's been, it, it's been, um, it was hard, but you know, we, we got here and it wasn't that easy, but we, we made it this far and we just want to continue doing what we're doing 
um, because the people need us, the community needs us, and we're just here to help the community. And if government can't do it, you know, we're gonna step in and do it ourselves, and that's what we've been doing. I was up at five o'clock in the morning. Um, I could feel the wind. I went outside and I sat in my car and I felt the strongest gusts of wind. And I was like, really like caught off guard because I do understand there was a, Hawaii, uh, a, a high wind warning, but two weeks prior we had prepared like we were going to get hit by a hurricane. So people were more on it. Make sure you had gas in your car, stock up on your water, so on and so forth. This one seemed to be a little bit more downplayed and caught people off guard, but but there definitely was a strong wind at five o'clock in the morning that blew like maybe like five times that I remember. And, and I was like, wow, it's powerful. And I wasn't surprised um, to see the fire department. But what surprised me was to see fire engines going up Lahaina Luna. And I lived halfway up Lahaina Luna. My house got burned down. Well, the owner, you know, my owner, my friend, Ann lost her house. And I was living there and um, the fire trucks went up about maybe 15 after five after that gust and they didn't have their sirens on i thought that was i uh, they went up stealth almost as if like they didn't want to wake up the neighborhood that there was a fire but i'd say about 5 15 in the morning which yeah in the morning because the gust of wind is about five i mean about 10 or 10 to to 15 minutes later um is when i noticed there were three fire trick fire trucks going up behind the lunar road but their sirens weren't on. They just kind of went up there in stealth mode. They didn't have control of it. They abandoned it from my understanding. Um, I even saw a video, I have a friend, uh, I'll give you his number, but he lost, uh, he had he had everything, like showed me like here, this is when they came that morning, this is them leaving, and then this is them coming back, and this is us evacuating. He had it going from the morning all the way to the night. If, if the firemen would have camped out with that fire all day and all night and not say it was under control, it was out, because what happened was it died down. It wasn't extinguished, you know? And then when that wind picked up again, because the wind died down too, it just came in. And when the wind picked up later in the afternoon and reignited it, it was already set. Like the entire area that was already burnt, that became the, the fire, the flames that that reignited and went straight to the structures. All I know is that the power was off um, after, after I believe the, the power poles and then more and more power was going off because all day power lines were blowing over. They were getting knocked down all throughout the day. Um, all I know is that I needed to get my cell service. I needed power. I, I was in a situation where I had to come up this way because I was looking for cell service or hoping that there would be power up here, come get a meal. I had no communication on my phone, wasn't working. Um, I was low on gas, totally unprepared. Um, so phone was already dying. Only way I could charge my phone was pretty much in my car and my car was low, but I really wasn't thinking about the severity or the fact I heard just through the wireless network, we call it the coconut wireless network, I heard that there was um, a fire. The, the, I heard that the fire was put out. Then all of a sudden I heard the fire started again. I didn't know how bad it was until around 4 p.m. after going around trying to find a place to eat, trying to get my phone charged up. I spent all my time out here not knowing how bad it was until I got on the highway 30 and I started heading south towards Lahaina and I could see the fire and I was really concerned because the smoke was more black and the location was not where I know there's brush. The location was right over Lahaina town and I watched it throughout sunset. I was waiting for the evacuation and that's another failure is that they didn't evacuate properly earlier enough. In fact, some places, they, in, in, I can even say there was no evacuation. There was no sirens. There was no way for people to know, you know, and then again, a lot of people stayed they were trying to save their home. They, you know, a lot of kids weren't in school. Um, I had a friend that worked on the south side, on the other side of the fire at Pulmon at the other end. All she had to do was make a right turn and she would be safe, but the police would not let her turn right. Nobody was turning right. They turned her back and directed her back towards Lahaina to come north out here, but nobody could get out here because they were, it was gridlock. 
they said the power lines were down, but number one, the power lines were dead. Anyway, um, they said that's why they wouldn't. But then my friend couldn't make it out on the north end of Kaunapali, and she turned around and went through a maze of gridlock and finally made it back to where she started off at her work at Pumana, and she turned right, and they, there was no police there. But the, the thing that got her, she took a picture in her, in her rear view mirror, it showed all of these cars coming into Lahaina. They were going into a death trap. They were coming from the other side. So they were able to leave that open. And on the north side where we would be able to evacuate people, there is a four lane highway. Only two lanes that were coming this way were open. They didn't shut down the other lanes to allow people to come all four and just fill up all four lanes. So, yeah, it was a big failure. I don't know why. Yeah, Fe President failure. Biden came here when we were still in the thick of things, maybe like two weeks later, I can't remember when, but when Biden came here, he didn't come over here to meet with the people. He went to one that was pretty much regulated, I guess, by the county. Uh, he didn't come down here. Um, I'm glad he didn't because we didn't need him here. We didn't need him here because they never came here. So he came after the fact with nothing. Least he could have done is come here and bring us a case of water for our people. He didn't do that. What he did was he blocked our convoy. He created gridlock because they blocked the roads off for him. So, so he made he made it more difficult. He didn't help our situation. He, that guy next to us just said he replayed the trauma. Yeah, he replayed the trauma. You would agree with that? I agree with that. He did. FEMA's providing like hotels, but it's all temporary. You know, they're in hotels and we're already getting people that are homeless, um, that are coming down here and they're being kicked out of hotels and, and they're really trying to move people out because the governor wants to reopen um, Maui, um, West Maui for tourism next month, what is it, September and October 8th, around that time and we're still healing, we're still, we're still struggling. Nobody should be coming, no tourists should be coming to the west side of Maui. Okay. Um, but do you encourage them to come to Maui? I, I, I would say that the other hotels in other parts of Maui, you know, my, my opinion is like, you know, let that economy happen over there, but let's just protect the West Side and let's just protect and respect the fact that we're still healing and the tourists are not going to be very welcome here. You know, um, we've had some people that come here and they're volunteers, but, you know, technically they're tourists, but um, right now, there's still, you know, probably a bad taste in everybody's mouth because when a lot of our people here that live here were starving and there was no power, there was nowhere to eat other than the few restaurants that were open on the west side, there was so many tourists because they couldn't eat in their own hotels. They had no power, but they were coming to places that had generators and a lot of our local people with families, they got, they got turned away, there was no room. So you had to wait in line for hours to get a meal until we started this here. Right. So now the roads are open, the power is on, you know, um, but it's, it's not back to normal. Um, Lahaina is rubble, you know, hearts are broken. People are still lost. Um, relief is still needed. Healing is still needed. We need to make sure that everybody is provided for. Everybody has a home. You know, we have we have evacuees. Right. You know, we have displaced people. Either they lost their job or they lost their home. And and then it's yeah, it's affected a lot of you know the economy. So a lot of people are feeling that that, right. that uh, I guess ripple effect. But um yeah, so I don't think Lahaina is ready for all that right now. You know, we don't want it to be a place for people to just pull up and take selfies. You know, we've been seeing that. And there's already some communities where they don't want, you know, they straight up will tell you that we don't want tourists here, um, you know, certain areas. So it would be nice if we can just keep everybody in the hotels yeah. until they get a home. You know, right now we don't want to see tourists in hotels. We want to see our community being provided for. That's what FEMA's for. Right. So for them, it's all about the money. And that's, that's the root of the entire problem is the people are put last because you got the other people on the top making the money, the corporations and whatnot. So yeah. this was our original tent right here where, that we had right over here on this table here um, with water. And um, these are our containers that were donated by um, Pasha and Makani Christian, uh, I'm sorry, Christian Makani. 
Um, we've getting a lot of support from Maui Rapid Response and so on and so forth. And this is our water drop-off station right here. As you can see, we're low on water, it goes quick. Um, and then this is our sign that we put up. You guys have a name for this place? Right there, Pu'uhonua Honokawai. How do you pronounce it? Pu'uhonua Honokawai. What, what does that mean? It's like a city of refuge, like a sanctuary. Oh. It's a place where people can come and, and heal and be safe. This is like the second week where we're kind of like scaling back on a lot of people are burnt out. So some people took the days off today, but some of us are hardcore and we're not going to stop, you know, so I can understand some of the people in leadership over here wanted a break, but we're still going. We're still keeping it open. We need our supplies. Um, we're going to get more and more organized and we're getting more people. So like the more the more help that we get, the more it requires getting organized. Yeah. And you guys set this up because you're not getting enough help. Yeah, we set this up from the beginning thinking that we're going to shut down as soon as we get help. And <laughs> we never got help, you know, like we're like waiting, like, where's the helicopters? Where's our supplies? Like, what's Why going on? It, not giving you guys help? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, you know, like, I don't know. All I know is what we got to do. You know, we're not going to wait around. We can. You're past thinking about. We're, we're past thinking of that. We, we just understand that they weren't here to help when we needed them. Doing it. And we're, we we did it without them. We made it through the thick and thin. We made it through the worst part. So yeah, this is our kitchen right here. Um, and our cooks are taking a break. If you guys are hungry, go get something to eat. We got the burners yeah, I mean, going. You guys literally have a whole community. Yeah, we do. We have a whole community here. People can just come and take what they need. People can come and take what they need, and it's coming f for free from all over the around the world and all over Maui, all over Hawaii. We are blessed with all of our supplies. And then we have our produce in here. This is our produce section. And on the other end, we have a keiki corner. We have rice and we have all kinds of produce, produce and stuff. Produce section. Yeah. Wow. This is our like, our little Costco. This is a relief station for healing and distribution. This is not a homeless encampment. This is not a shelter. So we don't have a bunch of you know people sheltering. There's a few people that don't want to stay in the hotels that would rather come stay and work with us and help us. So yeah, still have fun. Yeah, still yeah. And, and you know, this is a good place. Like a lot of people love to be here. They love the energy. This is, this is like the first phase of, re of relief. This is like the first phase so of step to the next. providing, yeah, providing relief so that people can eat and have their clothes and get their and the necessary supplies. But, but the, the phase that we're really focusing on now, right now is building our communities, our tiny home villages. And the ultimate step is getting the land, land. back to you guys. Ultimately. Yeah. Land is good. Land and, you know, so. Cool. Yeah, we definitely need the land. I, I really so appreciate much. being able to talk I appreciate to you. you too. I just all of a sudden just started getting dozens and dozens of messages from people saying the exact same thing, sending me the, the exact same photo. Um, I actually wasn't even following you guys before this and uh, instantly checked out your stuff, realized that a lot of people just kept saying these are the solid source, these are the guys you should talk to. So I actually messaged you. Uh, you're the first actually person that I've reached out to. We have been on all sorts of news stations and everybody's reached out to us. But you guys were the first person that the community kind of uh, seemed to step up and say we need to talk to. Um, well, for us, how it started, uh, my brother and I were actually in California racing a motocross race. Right when we finished the race, we uh, started getting some news that things were getting really hair hairy and really windy. Um, we didn't quite realize how scary it was until we got one phone call that Lahaina was on fire and then the phone call cut out. Um, from there, we, uh, we got really scared. We had one text come in two hours later telling us that the entire town was burning down. And uh, it's almost, I'd like to think that it was a godsend that we weren't there because we expected worst case scenario, which it really was. And we were able to use our connections as surfers and fishermen to be able to call almost everyone we knew on Molokai, Oahu, Big Island, Kauai, and just really let everybody know that, hey, we may need some help. 
Um, we haven't pulled the trigger yet, but right when we land, we're, we're gonna let you know whether we really do need uh, support or not. And it, it was something that news was not getting out. There was n absolutely no uh, word from the mayor for over 24 hours at all. So it was um, something that we didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even know if my family was alive or not. We have four generations here. So right when we got to Maui um, and we were able to hear firsthand how bad it was, we, in, on the other side of the island, were able to make those calls. Zane, my brother, was able to make those calls to all these fishermen and surfers from around Hawaii to be able to say, hey, this is worse than we're even thinking it was, and we need all the support we can possibly get. I was on the phone with my wife mm -hmm. after we finished um, that dirt bike race, as my brother mentioned, and she's telling me it's getting really scary, you know, houses are getting evacuated, and Do you know I'm kind of worried. That yeah. was August 8th in the morning. No, August 8th, uh, no, for us in, in California, no, it was uh, right. Seven. It was 2 p.m. It was around 2 p.m. for us. So yeah, so it was been about 11 p.m. here. No, it was 11 p.m. here. 11 a.m. here. So it was around midday. On the 7th okay. or the 8th? No, on um, on the 8th. Midday on the 8th at around noon is when his wife called, completely freaking out about the wind. We weren't able to come back for actually until the following morning, not the next day, but the following two days after morning. Yeah, we were doing all we could to get back home, and you know the flights said they're full, full, full. We just went to the airport with all the supply we thought would be necessary. VHF radios, MREs, all kind of uh, emergency things. And we got to the airport and there's all kinds of other families trying to get home to see to their, to their own family in Maui. And one of the ladies working behind the desk recognized us and said, hey, you guys are from Lahaina. Yeah, you, you're trying to get home to your family. And we're like, yeah, we, you know, we don't know what's going on. We're just trying to get home. And she we, put us on the flight and she said, hey, don't don't tell don't tell anybody, but we're going to get you on this flight. And Maddie and I are really confused because we step on the plane and the plane's pretty much empty. It only has news crews on it, CBS, NBC, Fox, all these different news crews. And we're like, how is how is it that there's families trying to get home to mm -hmm. see how see if their theirs are alive mm -hmm. and this plane's empty with news crews, but regardless, we were just grateful that we were able to get onto that plane mm -hmm. and to get home. And this was about a day and a half later by the time we made it onto Maui. And we still couldn't get a hold of our families once we landed because there was no cell phone service on West Maui where the fires were. So we got to get on a boat loaded with all of our supply. Mm -hmm. We went straight to our family um, neighborhood. Because the, ro the roads were closed. There's no way into Lahaina. Lahaina is completely cut off like its own island no cell service, no road access in or out. Literally the only way was by boat. And where we grew up in Kahana is a fishing village and there's a small boat ramp there. The county's been trying to shut down for decades and thankfully they haven't because it was our lifeline for all of our friends, all of our family and our community. We brought in over a hundred thousand pounds of supply to that small little boat ramp. And these were humble fishermen from neighboring islands that literally watched our town burned all night. And they were there the next morning with supply, without a call asking for help. Mm -hmm. They knew what was going on. They were there to try and be there for us. And, you know, it just kind of continued snowballing from there. You know, we started assembling VHF radios from our fishing boats and making stationary communication hubs that we were distributing to our, our family run shelters because there was no one stepping in to help us. Mm -mm. For over a week, it was just us, you know, no ins, no outs, no phone service. It was insane what our little community of our friends, our classmates, our neighborhood was able to overcome. There's a very small network of people that have access to that, that private boat ramp. This isn't a public or county run ramp. And so with our VHF communication that was set into place as boat and ocean people, we used VHFs. We were able to distribute them by hand and be able to coordinate a channel that would be public for us to communicate supply distribution and as well ship to ship communication, ship to port. Mm -hmm. We were able to have uh, small shuttle boats, even paddle boarders, surfers on boards, small boats, meet them at the channel. And the big boats would come and moor outside in the sand and our small shuttle boats would unload supply, bringing things in to our, you know, 100 plus people chain, just passing stuff from the water 
to our supply hub across the lower road yeah. and it's um pretty insane you know we're, we're over a month now since the day of the fires and there's these highs and lows that we know as ocean people we're we're, we're trained to be able to make decisions under pressure and to adapt in an environment that's constantly changing and you know i think we're right now in this high point of comfort you know and all the people that were displaced for the most part have been opened and welcomed into the hotels for a short period of time but they're going to be displaced again come october and so right now our community and my brother and i all of us we're just trying to do our best to prepare for that because host families like my brother and I and other families that still have their home standing are very overwhelmed come October. There's gonna be six to 8,000 people flooding into family homes again. And we wanna be prepared for that. So we've been putting everything we can together to make modular housing that can be put on extra driveway or yard space. Um, we've been doing kids programs daily at Napili Park with the Kekona family and our family not-for-profit every week in the ocean for ocean safety and just general you know trauma relief give the parents an opportunity to see their kids having fun in a safe environment and you know at Kahaku Kahi that's our family um, ocean academy our goal is to introduce kids to stewardship through sport and cultural practice but now with all these fires, it's so much more broad. Like it's just, we're just trying to make sure kids have something consistent. They might be up in nice hotels right now, but they don't feel comfortable. Hotels are a place where you go for the weekend. It's a place that you know is very temporary. It's not a place that feels like home. So no matter how nice some of these hotels are, these people are not comfortable. They have anxiety. They don't know how long they're gonna be there for and they understand that it's supposed to end sometime around October. And what's the plan once it ends? That's the question, what's the plan once it ends? I mean, I, we have no idea. Right now, I, we truly feel um, like the media or whatever it is, is trying to make it look like everything's okay here. Everybody's still locked away in these hotels. It looks like there's nobody sleeping in their cars. It looks like things are kind of slowing down. You don't see the destruction because they put up these big black tents around Lahaina. But, Come October, come a little later, when all these people have to come out of the hotels, it's gonna be a completely different story. When we have our own family homeless and losing so much, we're doing what we can right now, you know? And we're trying to make it as comfortable for them as possible come October when they're displaced from the hotels again. But not only comfortable for the guests, but also for the host families, because, you know, you gotta understand, like. All these houses up here the first two weeks had 15, 20 people under every roof to two, two toilets if you're lucky. And so we got to learn from that experience and we have a little bit of time right now. We've been collecting funds, getting workforce together and building these modular houses that can go at host families, extra driveway space or yard space. And there are talks of some spaces being open and available. There's right now a four acre lot from a private developer that has allowed two to four years for housing. And so we could also put those modular houses there. But, um, you know, I think right now we know that we can do our best efforts for our family and also replicate a process that's successful for others. We keep getting all this red tape. People are getting evicted. We're starting to build tiny homes and certain land that we can and people are getting evicted. So we just need support from the county and the state. That's it. We need them to say, hey, we're gonna lift this red tape the other change. community members are doing to help the community right now, but we need people's voices to go in and stand up and tell the government and tell the county what we want. The big thing that I, I really feel like they are, they're trying to hide right now, the media, whoever it is, like I said, is the fact that people are homeless right now and they're putting them all in the hotels to make it look like nobody's homeless for a few months. That's not permanent. There's gonna be a release, They're gonna, or it's gonna be trickling, but no matter what, there is not enough housing here and something needs to be, some action needs to be taken now for housing and for schooling because and our kids do not have schools to go to right now. There's over 2,000 children that were in the Department of Education that are right now 
either not in school or had to change and go out of state or find a private school to get into. And right now, everything's maxed out. The one thing that I know on the outside with all these missing children that people are saying, let me tell you what, a lot of people died. A lot of people died, all right? This is fucking horrible. Um, but the 2,000 missing children, I, I feel that the rumor started from the Department of Education releasing that there are 2,000 kids that are not in, that are not back in the Department of Education right now. They released that there's over 2,000 unaccounted for children. And people took that the wrong way. Mm -hmm. People took that as though there's 2,000 kids that aren't found or something. And I really do think that that statement right there that they made about 2,000 kids not re-enrolling in school or that are out of school is what really made all these rumors jump out about 2,000 kids being taken in submarines or all these other things, you know, which I'm sorry, um, we don't have time for those sort of things. We're just trying to get our community going. It's bullshit. I mean, we, we know everybody in this, I don't wanna say everybody, we knew most people in this community, we'd all be talking about it. I re as a community and the, the number that we keep, like I just keep hearing right now is, it, 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 it's hard to believe that it's under 500. Yeah, 500. 500 yeah. people. It's really hard to believe that we lost under 500 people. I know It'd be closer to like 900 if I were to make like an estimated educated guess from what we've been hearing throughout the family, throughout the connections, throughout the body bag count that was available on Maui County that was drained. You know, it's just by personal accounts, by friends that we have talked to on how many I have one friend that has saw seven bodies in one spot. I have another friend that saw nine and these are you know it's just like how can there be so many people that saw so much historically our location in lahaina is famous for winds that flatten everything in its path and in our short lifetime we've experienced you know a lot of winds that caused down telephone poles that spark a fire and especially when we're talking about uh, agricultural industry mm -hmm. that utilized a mass portion of our land space for farming and then abandoned it and left dry land that's abandoned and ready to burn. Completely mismanaged. You know, and so when an industry comes in and mismanages that much land and leaves everything dry, and then we have consistent winds that blow down poles, fires happen. And, you know, I have friends that live in Lahaina Luna where the fire started who who woke up early in the morning and saw the poles on the ground with sparks flying. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as people from Lahaina, it's like, it's like, oh, another fire, come on. Like, yeah. how many more, do, how much more is it, are we gonna have to take before the companies are gonna be accountable right. and before they put the electric wires underground, before they put the water back in the streams, before they restore resource management? because we really we we grew up from an industry that was taken advantage by agriculture and they just up and left to philippines because it was cheaper down you gotta think long term and right now all of these poles i mean look around us right now there's wires hanging over your guys head behind you it's absolutely crazy if you stand out my road and look up the road half the poles are hanging they've been they've been there for decades you don't have to be a genius, man. I don't know how we put up for this for yeah. so long. You fly in a helicopter, you fly a drone, you just look at West Maui. All you see is hotels along the beach. We don't even have access to our own beaches in a lot of places. The priority for our beaches is the tourists. It is not for the community. And the only other big things you see besides neighborhoods is golf courses. Mm. That is not for the community. We're adopting these sources of income and tourism strategies from decades ago. Right now, we got to look at new places, new cities that are coming up nowadays. Ecotourism is huge. There is a way to really integrate effective communities that are really taking care of the land all the way to the ocean and also bring in tourism to help plant things, to help be involved with the community, to get hands on, to actually learn about the Hawaiian culture and not yeah. just go to a luau. Yep. or jump off the rock, right? We, there's ways to work and it's being shown across the world, but pl places in America, places like here are blind to it. Yeah, what's and it's, your, it's unfortunate, but you know, we have you know, replaced the successful 
a process with one that's not successful. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Hawaiians were masters of resource management. They, nev they didn't have problems feeding their people. And now from COVID and this disaster, it's proven time and time again that any hiccup in our economy and everyone's left helpless, we need something, an alternative economy that we could rely on so that when shit hits the fan, we're not all help, you know, left swimming out in the depths. Mm -hmm. Um, hundred percent people should be coming to Maui. We need people to be supporting our our people. We need money coming in. That is the number one thing we need. And we have a lot of people that have given so much to us uh, and given what they had to Maui. And now they can't even afford to pay their own rent on the other side. But I'm talking about Maui generalized. Lahaina is closed. Yeah. Lahaina should stay closed. Yeah. And the one thing is, is we want tourism to come, but how can we know, how can we be confident that they're gonna be respectful enough to stay away from Lahaina? Yeah. That's the one thing we know, is if tourists wanna to come to Maui, be respectful, do not come to Lahaina, and do not, don't come to Lahaina. If for the people that do wanna support us from afar and support the community efforts, you know, businesses do rely on tourism but we can still have businesses be supported and operated by mm -hmm. people buying gift cards and donating them to local families then these businesses can still be making money and local families can go and buy things with no shame mm -hmm. you know and and so there are ways that we can keep these families successful and these small businesses successful without relying on these thousands of tourists every day. Mm -hmm. And so for the people who are visiting Maui and they're on the North Shore or they're on other parts of Maui, thank you for respecting our space in Lahaina. And for everyone out there that wants to be a part of this, it's as simple as gift cards to local businesses that you can share to locals. Mm -hmm. Because we need to keep these local businesses going, but we also want to give locals the freedom to be able to get what they need and not just get old clothes donated. There's a lot of redundant things that keep coming in mm -hmm. and our family run shelters may not have the capacity to hold these things. And I'm sorry, just to elaborate on that, I really meant until it's open. Yeah. When Maui does, when Lahaina does open up and they say it's okay for tourism to go, we do need money, we do need to work, but just please be respectful. Understand that people are grieving. It's hard to see weddings on the beaches. It's hard to see people running around laughing, drinking alcohol, having fun right now. If you're gonna come after it does open up here in Lahaina, just please be respectful, please. If, uh, if you guys want to support what we're doing, um, we run an organization called Kahaku Kahi. Uh, it's hard to spell, but you can also go to MauiCommunityAlliance.com uh, where we have a little spot where you can see some vetted nonprofits here in Lahaina that are from Lahaina, including my brother and I's uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, my name is Law. Um, and this is Lauren, my fiance, and together we own a kayak fishing business, Boom Kanani Inshore Adventure Club. Um, we're on Maui here in Iao Valley, which is actually just on the other side of the, the ridge from La, Lahaina, um, not too far uh, from that area. Um, so yeah, what we do for a living is we take tourists out, we take them fishing, we take them whale watching, snorkeling, um, kind of, just take him out on the water and have a good time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah that's it. this is the setup right here. Yeah, yeah, it's good fun. It's how we make a living. Yeah, yeah. it's our, yeah. it's our, it's our main source of, uh, of income. Pretty much had you know, people that have huge following, celebrities that went onto social media and, and specifically told people not to come here. Jason Momoa. Um, following the fire. Following the fire, yes, to give you know which everybody. So when it comes down to it, Lahaina is closed and will be closed for a while, respectfully, and needs to be that way. Absolutely. Um, needs to be rebuilt by the people that are from there, and they need to be given the time um, to try and put themselves in the situation to have their their words heard and to try and try and put their power into it. Put themselves um, back together too, yeah. give them so time. Th that, that being said, that, that has to be respected, but at the same hand, there's a, you know, a lot of the people 
that have lost their homes um, are staying with family members, whether it be on Maui or on another island, or staying with friends. And so that has been a ripple effect onto them as well, um, helping to support those people, which they would do no matter what, their friends and family, and that's how we do it out here especially. Uh, but yeah, at this point, it's kind of a time where these people that are being affected as well are trying to kind of put pieces together to see how they can continue to provide for their family and provide for the ones that are that are in need as well. And even us from Maui, you know, when everything was uh, before this happened, it was an ongoing joke for a lot of people that didn't live on that side or weren't from that side that, you know, it's almost like another island. You know, once you drive through the tunnel, you know, if you're from Kihei or from somewhere else, it's like we, we went somewhere else. You know, it was such a, a beautiful and magical side of the island. Um, and we all love to go over there and share that. It was a great place to surf and dive and do all kinds of things that we love to do here in Hawaii. We all have friends and family there. Everybody does. Yeah. People and we love. Right? We did. We lived, yeah. in, we lived in Waikuli, which was yeah. uh, the house we lived in over there was burnt. Most of the neighborhood was burnt. Yeah. Um, I'd say the majority of our friends that live over there, uh, all of this stuff went down with the fires as well. Our Maori Ohana, which means our Maori family, which everybody kind of has out here if you don't have family. Everybody lost everything. Their businesses on Front Street, their homes. Um, it's been pretty devastating. We feel so lucky because we have been so fortunate to have only lost uh, an asset of our business. Yeah. People have lost every, everything. Yeah. So it's absolutely so devastating. And again, it reaches the entire island. Everybody has an auntie, aunt, aunt uh, uncle, Ohana in Lahaina, and it, it touches everybody on the island. Uh, we've got about five, five kayaks. Um, boat. Uh, we had a boat that we used uh, alongside with the business. Free fire, so the One way we ran it, we're all guided tours actually. So okay, cool. we didn't send them out, the guests out alone, but still we would run, I'd say uh, when, it, when it's busy, you know, two to three tours a day, okay. um, you know, four or five days a week on average. Cool. Within days, we had emails and phone calls from guests that had already booked tours in the future, near future, telling us specifically, listen, we've been seeing stuff on social media saying we should not come there. Yeah. Um, should, we, should we cancel our tour? Should we not come there at all? You know, and so especially at that time, it was very confusing for all of us. It was very you know, confusing. Wanting to be as respectful as possible, and not quite being given the time to really <clears throat> put together the pieces as to what our next move should be. Nobody really knew anything right. specifically. You know, we didn't have any government officials that came in to help or do anything within any immediate response time right. uh, to have any kind of you know, clarity as to really the situation that's going on and where it happened and how it happened. How many tours in a week? Pre-fire? Pre-fire, I'd say, you know, maybe six to eight. And the last yeah. week, how many have you done? None. Oh, none. none. We haven't done anything we in a month. We haven't had anything since, since that. Yeah, everything's been canceled. We have one tour, I think, in the next three months. Yeah, it's it, the ripple effect has gone on. You know, we felt it immediately with getting emails asking them you know, if this is what they should do into kind of not having any tours at all, nothing being booked, you know. And we primarily worked on that side of the island. You know, our marketing and everything was primarily on that side. We just got in with the Westin, like we, we just got just, the Westin contract, the Marriott group, like we're rolling, oh, like yeah. we're living we off this started, income. Um, yeah. What did the Westin say to you after they said, hey, not right now? Oh, well, we're still on their docket, but yeah. they're closed. They shut all... down to, to they didn't even know. come stay. Right. Um, which is great. Hotel, which is, we're so Absolutely. happy. Yeah, stoked for that. Not, you know, having anything come in to make that. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So it's more just, you know, we're, just we're being patient. Kind of restart and be patient. We've tried to get a small business loan, mm -hmm. um, and so we're still waiting to hear back. I physically went in like literally as soon as I heard where it was, I went um, and it's been quite a long time and it's been in a withholding status because of issues and they're worried about our ability to pay back the loan. We have a caseworker, we've got a case number, um, we have the ability to contact them. They are very communicative. It's just is a long, complicated process for people that really need stuff now. And so if it happens, I pray it happens. If it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. But. We'll, 
we're kind of banking on that. We we don't really. Uh, yeah, that's. We can't really get FEMA. We didn't really have. We had a boat burned down, but we can't really get any solid help because we're in the loophole. We didn't have yeah. a business in Lahaina, but we operate out of Lahaina. That's where all of our customers come from. Ninety percent of them. And so the next day, I was telling him, I was like, people are emailing. It's. I mean, they're dropping like flies. Yeah. So. And there's, um, there's quite a few, you know, small businesses like that. That There's so the many. West side, um, so many. That didn't necessarily have a, a, you know, a building that they stored all their stuff in per se, and so they still have most of their supplies to operate. But it's come to a complete stop with you know, complete lack of tourism. I do think it's been politicized. I think there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on. A lot of political. Um, uh, interpretation behind what has happened um it's super complicated it's super confusing you know you have groups that want people to come here you have groups that need people to come here and the government is not helping anybody so everyone is at odds at that point point. and i think why people are confused about it is because the government hasn't done what they should have so yeah that's far. one quick point was you know when it comes to our resources and this is just a small part of it, but it shouldn't even be a question. It shouldn't even be a question. It shouldn't even be a question. The, the lack of government's help immediately put the community into a situation at where, odds. Uh, we're slightly at odds because, yeah, we, we do need to put these resources to the people who immediately need it and are going to need it for a decent amount of time. It's not going to end in a week or two, right? So if the government had showed up when they should have, we wouldn't be here. They should have, we wouldn't be in this situation. Right? People wouldn't be saying not to come here because there's no resources. It wouldn't even have been a thought. I think it comes down to the lack of, of government uh, response, you know, response, culpability, accountability. Yeah, we've got us two. We've got a two year old, a one year old, and then again, one on the way. And it's about groceries. How much? I mean, groceries and diapers a week is I mean, we're heading towards a thousand dollars a week, maybe 750. I'd say yeah. diapers, formula, that's a and groceries. One time payment. That's a small Costco run. <laughs> I know. I just spent 600 bucks yesterday for the week. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it was definitely insulting. <laughs> These poor families, they have is, meds that uh, probably, I mean, they've got elderly all the way down to babies and their family. A lot of these family have, oh, gosh, is insane. we're at $5 a gallon on average out here, yeah, you that, know. That was definitely pretty disrespectful. I, I, I would take it myself. In that or I, I would say uneducated too. I would say it was very uneducated uh, uh, and my, my decision. So I will say yesterday I was at Costco and there was an auntie that was talking that works at Costco, an older auntie, she had to be about 70. And she was talking about how her landlord, she's month to month rent. I had to stop and listen because I could hear that she was really upset and she was talking to one of her friends that was a shopper. And she has now had to move because the month to month rent was just increased by $600 because they know that everybody on, everybody on island is looking for a place to live. Um, and so the competition is higher. And so now she had to move um, because they raised the rent on her. And so I do believe this is one issue that hasn't been addressed that a lot of people aren't talking about. Uh, local landlords are increasing. Local landlords, prices. yeah, potentially doing that. that. That I will say that's the only story I've heard, but that is a very, very important story to be told. Um, I felt so bad. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's not uncommon for landlords to raise the rent. Uh, with our rent already being so high here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's definitely something that, you know, if not the majority, some people are gonna be taking advantage of doing. It. You know, I think to try and maybe end on a positive light myself too with everything is, uh, you know, I think that the, the biggest way that the world, the mainland, anybody that's not here um, fighting this fight with, with the community and the islands, uh, biggest way to be supportive would be to understand that, yes, the rest of, uh, of Hawaii, not only Maui, um, is open. And uh, we need all of your love and support um, that we can get. If you guys want to go kayak fishing, if you guys want to see some whales, we get the humpback whales that come down here from Alaska. You want to go out and take the family out and have a good time. Um, you can go to bkmaui.com and you can book directly. There's all of our contact information up there as well. So you can go ahead and give me a call uh, directly. Uh, but yeah, you know, coming coming to Maui um, and, and sharing all that love with the other islands as well. Um, 
Lahaina is closed. Lahaina is closed. The west side is closed. The upper west side past Lahaina uh, eventually will be opened up to those communities. Um, but Lahaina specifically in the west side uh, in that area is closed and will be and needs to be respected. The rest of Maui, everywhere else is open and, and needs your support. The best thing you could do would be to come out here and uh, you know spend that spend your money with the, the local small businesses, local the small businesses, local businesses um, that 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 are going to be spo supporting their families and, and their friends and everybody else here that, that's uh, in need of that support. Send DM, DM us. Um, if, Let us yeah, get you anybody, a mahi. Yeah, anybody uh, on here sees this. Poles, we got everything. Load them down. Uh, we've got all the top top notch gear and. Uh, if you guys are hearing this and you want to come book with us, go ahead and mention that when you speak to us and we'll give, give you, you a good a discount. discount. All right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. Mention real news, not bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, can we get some...